Tonight we uh, have someone I've uh, had really, 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 really interesting chats with. Uh, he likes to engage the audience. He likes to ask questions. He likes, he, he's very uh, inquisitive. So I think that's going to be a very good evening tonight with uh, Matteo Zalio. Uh, please uh, give him a big welcome to Cambridge. Matteo, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining tonight. And thanks, Sasha, for... Uh, uh, kindly asked me to join this meetup and uh, and talk a little bit about my experience. Well, um, I strongly believe that uh, everybody is a designer. Everybody has the potential to be a designer of his own or her own solutions, and in particular, a designer of uh, of uh, of uh, your own life. So let me share with you uh, just uh, a couple of images because I feel. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. Uh, I have uh, some problems with memory, so I always need to see images or references of what I'm going to say. And that's the reason why I'm a designer. Well, honestly, uh, I am a designer, but my first job is to be a researcher because I'm currently a research fellow at uh, University of Cambridge. And um, I'm working at the Engineering uh, Design Center in the Engineering Department. And um, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about inclusive design tonight, uh, just because, I mean, I'm not the, um, the, the world expert on inclusive design, but I want to share with you my story of how I came uh, into inclusive design. And in particular, I like to say um, designing with people, for people, and by people. So let me just start with this um, uh, with this sentence, because it's something that I ex uh, explored and I, I figured out during my, let's say, um, life career or life path, I would say, that design is about empowering self-expression. Because when you make something, you feel empowered because your brain, your hands, your whole body is um, embedded into a process of creating, of making, of uh, uh, developing some something. It could be uh, just a sketch, it could be uh, making a 3D printing an object, it can be uh, making anything, making a lunch, making a soup, writing a book, doing a, a, um, a work plan for your job. That's about design. And so I'll, uh, uh, I'll share with you this image because it's me a couple of years ago when I was uh, very keen on uh, on playing and having, I uh, was quite, quite lucky because I got a lot of, uh, as you can see, little tools that enable me to, to basically be a builder, to um, uh, build and to make things. And in particular, I remember that I was always getting my toys, dismounting them and trying to build new stuff with the pieces that I was dismounting from different toys. The only issue is that just a few moments after I was dismounting and trying to build something new, well, what that what was something new normally didn't work well as the toy previously. And the big the bigger problem was also that the parts that I that I disassembled were not fitting again to each other. So basically I was breaking a lot of toys. But this actually was pretty helpful because it enabled me to discover later in my life uh, during high school and so on, uh, a way of self-expressing what were my thoughts. So basically going into arts, arts and uh, um, sculpture and installations and so on. And these are some of my works. And so I then uh, moved into um, a master degree in architecture just after my high school. And, um, and then I went through, uh, through all the five years uh, uh, architecture degree uh, back in Italy. And then I enrolled into a PhD in industrial design with a focus on user experience uh, for um, aging societies. And then after I'll move, I moved to other countries and I, and I did a lot of a bunch of other stuff that I, I might tell you later, or you can ask me if you're curious about. But what I wanted to highlight now is that I noticed that I shifted from an egocentric perspective to a people-centric perspective. 
And this means that, you know, when I was a kid, I was, as I told you, getting toys, dismounting, disassembling them and trying to build something for the sake of making. Mm -hmm. Later on, I made this beautiful, for me, <laughs> works of art. And these were mostly about my thoughts, my ideas expressed onto um, a frame, expressed through crafting, uh, my different materials like uh, iron, steel, uh, clay, and so on. But then once, once I went into studying more the discipline behind making and so designing, I understood that there is more than just the uh, ability to make, but there is the ability to make in order to solve people's challenges, people's problems, people's issues. And so I understood that moving from being an artist, as I was basically at that time, into being a designer, there is a shift from being an egocentric kind of um, um, uh, way of uh, developing uh, a, a work of art or, or a piece of uh, or a piece of, a piece of design into something to more people centric. So developing solutions for users for people, and so what I can tell you now is very briefly my my history. So um, after my master degree, I started working as an architect for private clients. And I was particularly interested in environmental accessibility. So while I was working with clients, I understood that I did know nothing about accessibility and inclusivity. And so I enrolled into a um, PhD in industrial design with a focus on age-friendly design. And I was working on um, basically uh, understanding how smart technology could help people to live a better life in their dwellings. And I had the chance to work on several projects, uh, uh, European projects mostly, uh, for example, a, um, a wearable system to monitor daily activities and also on an autonomous telepresence robot. And then after that period of life, I, I understood that um, it's not only about designing, but it's about designing for people's needs. And designing for people's needs means to understand what people want. And it's not, again, just egocentric plus some sort of uh, aesthetic or form or fit or function feature to include into your design, but it's about doing something that helps really the people around us. And so I, I got a chance then to work a, a couple of, uh, almost a year, nine months for a company. But in the meantime, I, I was asking myself, why am I doing this? I think I need to learn more. And so I, was, I made a search query on Google and I wrote exactly this uh, four, three words, postdoc assistive technology. I got then uh, three, three results actually. Uh, one was a, a, an offer for a postdoc at Technological University Dublin, Ireland, and other two at KTH in Stockholm. And so I applied and uh, a few days after I got an answer from Dublin, they invited me to uh, have an interview over there. So I said, well, why not? Let's spend a weekend in Dublin. And so I went there on Friday, I had my interview, I spent the weekend and then a few days after they said, well, we think uh, we're very interested in you. Why don't you come? And I said, oh, wow, now, now I need to move out of Italy and, and decide what to do next. I mean, and, and, and go there. And, and it was, of course, completely new for me. So I took the chance. The decision was not easy, but I, I'm happy now that I got there and I was... Um, and I had the chance to do a three-year postdoc in assistive technology and accessibility. Mm -hmm. And in this period of life, I got a lot of uh, opportunities. I developed a lot of uh, collaborations and I worked on several projects. But also I felt that uh, just being in academia and doing research and getting funding for other projects was not enough for me. So I managed to open a startup and work on a project that is called Tailed which is a smart bicycle fender for all cyclists. Now that experience was, wasn't the most successful of my life, but it gave me the ability to understand how things work in the um, venture capital, in the entrepreneurship world. And um, 
I have to say, I would do that again. I would still work my maybe 16, 18 hours a day between the daily work in the, in the university, in the academia, and the night, uh, evening, night, early morning work for my little uh, startup. Uh, and then after I got the chance to, um, to get a fellowship to go to Stanford University in 2018. And uh, at the end of the day, I spent two years at Stanford in California. That was probably so far the most amazing experience I had in my life because I connected with people from uh, the major tech companies you can think about. I was able to work with um, a lot of really interesting people and I learned a lot about uh, autonomous systems and uh, in particular about uh, how to foster accessibility into autonomous systems. So um, I spent two years over there and then <clears throat> I applied for another fellowship and um, I just, just recently came to Cambridge. So I spent two, two months uh, almost in Italy while after coming back from the US at the end of last summer. And then I moved to Cambridge uh, a month ago. Uh, I worked uh, on remotely until, um, uh, I mean, from Italy until uh, before the move to Cambridge. But then I came here and I'm lucky enough to be in the inclusive design group uh, where I'm working on um, uh, understanding how environments can be not just accessible and not just inclusive, but can guarantee equity and diversity for everybody. So this is a little bit of my background, long story. And normally they say, long story short, I made a short story long, but let's move to some examples. So I would like to tell you about all the projects that I've done, but of course we don't have time. If you want to check some of them you can look on my website, which is quite simple, matteozalio.com. But today I'm going to talk to you about two projects that are quite recent and they are diametrically opposed. Um, so one is called Simple Guy and the other one is Handy. So Simple Guy was born as an outcome of a research that I did uh, two years ago uh, mm, uh, on uh, understanding why certain populations have a hard time using smart devices. And in particular, I'm talking about older adults. So here, there are some pictures of uh, interesting phones that normally are used by older people or people with low digital literacy skills in order to you know, make phone calls and send text messages. And you can notice how these phones are different than this guy here. So, if I give them to my grandma or my mom or even my dad, well, they say, well, it's okay. The, the buttons are big, but why do I have to use that thing that it's different from what you have and your cousin have and your girlfriend has? So say, well, because it's easier for you to understand. Yeah, but I want to be, I don't want to be stigmatized for that. So I said, okay, well, let's do some research. Let's understand what people want and what people need. So this is just a summary of some of the research uh, steps uh, that uh, I went through. And just as a summary, what I can suggest is to always define a challenge, always understand who is your target user group, what are the objectives of your, let's say, research or your um, um, uh the objectives of what you want to reach and then define some questions. Then once you have the questions, you have to talk to people. You have to understand what your users, what the customers want. And then there are several methods to understand this. You can also, you can do a focus group, you can run a survey, you can do contextual inquiry, task analysis, A-B testing, you can do a lot of stuff. But then what you need to do is, is importantly, to get data, gather data, and then to synthesize this data, and then create an actionable concept or an actionable design. So in summary, what we found was that major the majority of times, the first impact with the technology looks like the lady on the left. So it's kind of a struggling um, a process of getting to use a new smartphone. But what I'm aiming to is to see, for example, older people or just people with low digital literacy skills, let's think about some countries all over the world that kind of have 
an access to tablets or smartphones, for example, and I wish to see them enjoying their first uh, selfie like the two guys on the right are doing. So this is considerably important because quite a lot of people right now are considered older adults and the projections are not going to be uh, nicer. I mean, they are going to grow uh, all over the world. So as I told you, the research question, which was quite important to frame, was to um, basically understand what were what are the obstacles of people with the low digital uh, literacy skills and how could we enable them to be equal participants in the digitalized world? So this was a very general question. Now, with the conversations, we try to understand the context of use, what kind of device people were having uh, issues with, what was their user journey and the usage process. And so we try to understand more about usability issues. And then what was an unsuccess rate uh, that was coming along their user journey. And so after that, we got the chance to run some focus groups with several participants uh, in, uh, in an international meeting uh, back in Denmark. And with this focus group, we wanted to find some, uh, let's say, pain point, some highlights and, and, uh, and um, um, let's say, pinpoint some uh, um, issues in the user journey. So I'm not going to go too much into details, but this is just a graphical representation of uh, what were the feedback from one of the focus groups. And uh, as a summary, we understood that um, people were lacking of uh, education, basically, and were lacking of uh, training experiences to basically help them to familiarize with the use of uh, smart devices. That could be smartphones, could be smart home devices, it could be an Amazon Alexa, it could be a Google HomePod, and so on. And uh, so. After that, I mean, our work as a researcher was done, but as you remember, as I'm a designer, I always like to make something more, to, to create something more. And so I was able to develop a design concept with the design team the, and the research team, which is basically to um, show customers and people how they can interact with a graphical user interface in a simpler way. So let me come back to the first slide. And here we have uh, our iPhone or our Android phone with a, a bunch of different apps, uh, several screens. Uh, and here we have the settings page, right? So we understood that the size of the icons, for example, the number of the functions and the number of the apps, uh, but also the size of the text uh, was a limiting factor that was creating uh, a lot of um, signalization and a lot of challenges in interacting with these devices for the first time. And so we, let's say, crafted a concept to um, enable a, a more inclusive and a wider audience uh, to use these devices by basically adding a toggle here with a simplified mode under settings that basically changes the user interface, the graphical user interface into something simpler with bigger icons, bigger text and less functions to basically mimic what the ugly, pass me this word, maybe I shouldn't say ugly, but what the phones that I showed you in the first slide are normally offering to older adults or people with uh, low digital literacy skills. So we want to basically, we wanted to change the graphical user interface to enhance uh, a, uh, a learning process to um, allow people to basically live, uh, um, to experience a learning experience, uh, sorry for the play of words, but in order to better understand how to use for the first steps a smartphone. So this was a pretty cool uh, project, I have to say, and, uh, and these are the differences. So basically we start from a, an original screenshot, which is for a first time user could be perhaps difficult to en engage, <coughs> sorry, with into something like that, a little bit more simple to use. And so I might say, well, you can ask me any question after, perhaps I just go forward with the, the second little project 
which is about uh, um, um, an open source device that I developed back in March when I was in uh, in the United States in the, during the shelter in place. So um, his name is Andy, and um, I was able to understand what was the major challenge, the major issue that people were facing back at that moment when the pandemics just um, uh, rise up in the United States uh, at the end of March, early April, when I went to the post office to pay my taxes for um, uh, in the United States. So I went there and this is a picture that I took from my car. And uh, after I did my work at the post office, I sat on my car for about one hour and I took around 65 pictures of people like this guy trying to get in and get out of the door, just a normal door with handles. But look at this guy. He used to have a mask, gloves, clothes, uh, um, napkins to open the door and he was scared of touching this door. And I said, well, this guy has a problem. And as well as him, Many other ladies, many other people getting in and out were literally scared of touching that door. And I said, well, maybe it's because of COVID, maybe because maybe we have to do something. And so I went back home. I made some sketches on a piece of paper. I took uh, a cardboard from the Amazon parcel that I got a few hours before. And I started cutting and modeling something like this, something like this object. And I made basically a couple of shapes. I did a, a 3D model and uh, I was able to then uh, not, unfortunately I wasn't able to do any user testing as we normally do when we design, but I was able to send some pictures of uh, the little tool that I made uh, with the cardboard to some friends and to get some feedback. And I, and I got quite nice feedback and I, and I thought, well, perhaps I should make this little thing available, open source for free for people. Because, I mean, we were at the start of the pandemic. We didn't know how to manage um, almost anything. In, back in Italy, we had thousands of uh, deaths every day and ICUs were really struggling. So I said, well, I'm not a doctor. I'm not uh, a machine learning engineer that can... Uh, Synthesize data in a, bu in a bunch of seconds from all over the world. Well, I make, I give my contribution. And so I made this little guy, which is a sort of uh, handy hook that helps people to interact with uh, different objects, such as door handles, buttons, uh, um, handles for the, in the car, uh, the ADM, uh, holding bags, and I decided to share online, basically, to make it available for free to download and to 3D print um, anywhere in the world. And I decided this be for two reasons, because I wanted this to be a, a an open source inclusive solution that could be modified and uh, created by um, anybody else. And also in order to foster this self-expression that I was telling to you at the beginning, but also in order to basically allow people to, um, to make it, to print it anywhere in the world. Also because there were a lot of constraints about uh, shipping and deliveries back at that time, if you remember. So it, to order like a mask or a set of masks at Amazon, it took probably 20 to 40 days back in March and April in the United States. So the delivery time was, was terrible for certain items. And so I said, well, let's share the, the tool as a software, as a soft thing, as a design, and then let's enable people to make it everywhere in the world. And so there were some features that I think came out very nicely. And uh, well, the results of sharing this idea were actually immensely, uh, were huge, were fantastic because I got, uh, um, um, I got so many requests, so many downloads, thousands of requests and downloads. Uh, I got, um, I think, about 40 or 45 articles on international magazines. So you can check on my website. I don't even, I just listed all of them there because I I couldn't keep track of all of them. Uh, but uh, I think that was the real power of this idea, sharing as an open source idea and enable people empower people to uh, self-express themselves by creating and making and recreating this object.
during a, a crisis. So here I got some, just a few feedback from people. And what I loved was uh, the first two were really great because this guy, Chris from UK actually, said how inspiring and engaging your story is. The pupils I work with will find your website fascinating and it's beautifully designed. And another guy, as a walker and mobility scooter user, so a person with some sort of disability, I am particularly bothered with doors to stores and commercial buildings that don't have power assist. I love to have Andy for dealing with these doors. And you cannot imagine, but I got so many people with motor disabilities uh, connected to me because they wanted to get uh, handy for their daily activities. And so I thought, well, maybe that's not just good for COVID. That's also good for people who have some impairments to just facilitate some of their activities of daily living, perhaps. And so I was pretty happy about this. And uh, I can just, um, let's say, come closer to the end and give space for you because I'm very curious to hear about what you want to ask me because um, well I with these two examples I can say that inclusivity is not just uh, uh, let's say creating something appealing but it's about designing and building solution solution that could be usable by as many people as possible. And the handy, I think it's a good example that I got the, I got lucky to, to have this intuition. And, and, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I mean, I was uh, um, sheltering in place. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to go to the lab and uh, engage with other people. But through the internet uh, and this, let's say, way of sharing as an open source tool, uh, it was almost like being in a, in a sort of uh, a real world where we could engage a person in person with people. And so uh, these are some of the, let's say, bullet points that I try always to remember when I need to do some research or better when I want to do design because that's what I, what I really love to is to, so when we do, when we are in our research process of understanding what people need, well, it's important to look for points of exclusion. And one point of exclusion, for example, for Handy, was that people were not uh, um, um, interacting with doors as they were normally doing before the pandemic. But also identify contextual challenges because everything we do is context dependent. Everything we do and we make and we create uh, is depending on the context where we <clears throat> sorry, make it. So if we want to build a house in Kenya, it's going to be probably quite different than a house built in Cambridge or a house built in Palo Alto. So another important thing is to recognize personal biases. Well, this is so hard. This is extremely difficult. And especially, I mean, um, my I can talk a little bit about my, my story. Uh, even just between in Italy, moving from my hometown to the city where I studied, Genova, I experienced some sort of, uh, let's say, um, personal bias just because I had a different accent from people from Genova. And we were all, we are, we were all Italians. So imagine somebody that moves from uh, a country and goes into another continent. Think about the language barrier, think about the cultural and the background and think about uh, the, um, the behavior and think about uh, all these personal biases that might be really um, embedded into a mentality that hasn't been exposed, for example, to different cultures, cultures for example. And uh, while this is quite hard to achieve, uh, aiming for equal experiences, but let me tell you, if we don't aim for that, then we're going to always make products that are not inclusive or not accessible. So at least it's good to know that we need to aim for it. Then, uh, well, engage inclusively, it's related to some sort of personal bias. It's not easy. And it's when you design, sometimes it could be just a work plan. It could be just a spreadsheet. It could be anything that you do, even in your working life. Well, 
uh, we tend to be overprotective to what we do, what we make. And here we go back to almost the, the very subconscious way of uh, dealing with our ego. And, um, and well, we have to forget about that sometimes in order to engage and to understand what people want. Then, uh, <clears throat> well, when we make something, when we make a product, when we make a, a piece of a software, a, an interaction, a solution, we have to be able to extend the solutions because as Professor Clarkson, which is my uh, mentor and the, the head of the lab, says it's about um, working on the extremes and working on the extremes means that uh, we are not just designing for, let's say, the average and middle uh, range of people, but let's focus first, for example, on the extremes, on the people who are at the very extremes of the, for example, uh, people abilities or people capabilities. And then if we can make something that works well for them, well, probably even who is in the mid range of capabilities will be able to use that device. An example of the phone that I gave to you before. We have one device that potentially can work for all if we only change little things. And so I came to the conclusion so far that, um, um, well, design is a matter of inclusion and uh, Inclusion is a matter of accessibility. And I can say this only now, because if you were asking me this 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, I'm honest, I couldn't say that because I didn't have the exposure to what, uh, um, uh, what design for inclusion and what accessibility means from uh, a user perspective, but also from a designer perspective. And talking about accessibility, I just give you some example. Accessibility is not about only getting into a building, accessing it to a building if you are a wheelchair, <coughs> sorry, user. But it's also about using a smartphone, using a tablet, using a computer. It's about getting into a car. And this is a car that I was lucky to see almost every day back in Palo Alto. It's a, an autonomous car made by Waymo, which is a, a company from the Alphabet Group. And uh, these cars are driving without a driver. Now you see a driver in the front seat, but because they were in a testing phase two years and one year ago, now they are starting to have cars without a driver in the seat. And if you get in and you cannot access and you don't have a person that helps you to get into the car, but you only have a robotic system, well, how this design can be inclusive? And of course, it's not, as I told you, only about getting into a, a, an apartment or in a building. It's also about how we interact with these objects around. And again, it's context dependent. Why we, do we have a button only for opening a door and perhaps not for locking a door? Maybe that could be a way of making it more accessible and include more people into the use, into the interaction process of uh, of um, uh, the objects we have around. And so, um, well, I might say that in general, good design is inclusive design. And uh, for mainly a reason, because it expands the product's reach. And here we make uh, marketers happy because they need to sell more. It sparks innovation. And so we make entrepreneurs and funding angels and investor angels happy because well, you know, if they get, if they see innovation, they fund your idea, but also helps everybody. So designers, because again, I believe everybody has a little bit of a designer in his own soul, helps designers to take a position of social responsibility, which I believe and uh, and I think that it's uh, uh, strongly advisable to to be socially responsible today, for many reasons that we might. Uh, want to talk later on. And so I guess, uh, Sasha, we are on time, right? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so that's all, guys. Uh, you can uh, ask me any question and uh, be a designer for half an hour, let's say. Ask questions and then craft your idea about it.
Okay, so indeed, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and to uh, ask, uh, you know, interact uh, with Matteo. Uh, that's that's your chance to um, to talk uh, with a, with a, a designer and a researcher in design. So, does anybody have a question? So maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna kick off uh, with questions. Um, <coughs> I found your talk really interesting because you're, you're uh, discussing the, the relationship of the object with the people in the sense that, that uh, accessibility and inclusivity is how, uh, what's the relationship between the object and the people. Now, uh, one interesting point was uh, becoming uh, less egocentric and more people-centric. What's the relationship or the, or the role of the creator in that? Because at the one end, we have... People, I don't know, Steve Jobs, who are, uh, who the history uh, kind of, uh, uh, history has made him a very up himself kind of, you know, he, he knows better. Like one of the quotes that gets out of his biography, rightly or wrongly, maybe some of that is romanticized, but is people don't uh, know what they want until we put it in front of them, which is quite a, a strong uh, you know, thing on the designer knows better. At the other end, there is uh, maybe uh, designers who are a bit more modest who kind of disappear behind their objects. The object is so well done that you just don't even imagine that somebody has invented it. Uh, what's, your, what's your position on the relationship of the, of the designer with creation? Should, we, should you be at the forefront? Should you be invisible? What, what, you know, how, what do you think about it? Well, uh, that's um, that's a really good question because, uh, well, as you can imagine, there are different uh, um, ways of, let's say, there are different behavior and there are different design approaches, let's say. So we can talk about a design-driven innovation. What some people think that, for example, Apple have um, has done in the past and is currently doing which I don't believe is completely true, but also there is the people-centered or user-centered or human-centered design process, which embraces human-centered, user-centered, universal design, inclusive design, design for all, and so on. And these are, let's say, um, diametrically opposed approaches because one privileges the, uh, uh, the um, idea that the... Um, master, the designer, the chief engineer has towards developing a new product before even as somebody could think about, even before um, asking questions to the customers and to the people. And there is the other approach, which is, okay, we start from a blank paper. We don't know anything about, we ask people, what are the struggles? What are the challenges? And then we build a solution upon this, the, the challenges we identify, the gaps we identify. Now, to me, there is no, uh, there is no, let's say one way process because I think that both of them, these two, let's say two processes that seems to be diametrically opposed are running onto a, a sort of a railway, uh, two parallel paths, because so sometimes you need to anticipate the needs of the market. But in order to anticipate the needs of the market, uh, you know already that there is an underlying challenge that the market uh, will face in the near future or in the very, very close future. So let's say the example of Apple, there has been other attempts of launching uh, smartphones and tablets in the early 90s. So 10 to 15 years before the big launch of the iPhone, right? I think everybody knows that. However, what was not ready at the time was the market need. I mean, there was a need. So companies identified the need of people to have something more than just a, a mobile phone or just a computer. However, there was not the infrastructure and there was not then the, um, let's say the underlying needs uh, really embedded into each person, each cons customer, each uh, user. Well, at that point when Apple was able to launch quite successfully, I, I have to say the smartphone, but even with the iPod that happened, um, 
they they really worked on to making the technology more humanized in a way that uh, they didn't only make a, a great piece of technology but they built the ecosystem behind to support that technology so they built the apple store they built the app store and they built basically the the ecosystem that was that piece of uh, that piece of the the tile of the puzzle that was missing before and i guess that came out from user research from understanding people needs because with the um, with the early attempt from nokia and uh, and even before from um, uh, motorola and also uh, i believe also the nec nec developed the nec communicator in 90 oh i think 99 or 2000 somewhere which was a sort of basically let's say a tablet a mix between tablet and a phone but um, I mean, the internet connection was not as reliable and stable and powerful as in 2007, the 3G, for example. The world of the apps that were created by people were not existing. So Apple did the, gave the opportunity to developers to create a bunch of different apps. And the apps are really what uh, makes the object, the phone, the smartphone, uh, alive and tailored to people's uh, people's needs. So I think both are important and uh, they come into the design process at different moments. And let me tell you, I mean, if everybody would be like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or many others or Karim Rashid, just to name pure designers, or uh, Philip Stark and so on, well, um, then we wouldn't have many challenges to do, to uh, solve uh, anymore. So it's better that there are not so many people like them. So there is a bit of uh, ability to become designer for almost everybody of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, uh, we're coming to the to the end of this um, of this session. If you have more questions, so uh, Matteo's website uh, is so here in the in the chat you have uh, matteozalio.com. Um, the the website is also um, in the announcement of this uh, of this evening. So feel free to to contact Matteo. I think it's fair to say that that you'd be happy to to answer questions. <laughs>